The following program is brought to you by Fan Bags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com to get temper and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use promo code BRAG for BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with Fanbags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands. I'm your host, Joe Jackson. Joining me is my friend, my co-host, Craig Bowers. As we, I mean, March Madness is here. We have the first four, three of the first four games done. Um, first round, the like all the games, that starts tomorrow. And we finally know Purdue's first round matchup, and that will be Grambling State as they beat Montana State 88-81. to It honestly was a really fun game to watch. Um, two 16 seeds battling at, it, battling at it. It goes to overtime, so... Purdue now officially knows their opponent. We will preview that game, uh, maybe preview a little bit of the rest of just kind of the overall Purdue's path, um, and then call it a night as, as it's a very, very fun day ahead of us tomorrow. Craig, throw it to you. Um, just, I guess we'll kind of do it like how we do a normal show, but how what were your <laughs> instant reactions to that game? Um, you know, one, just, man, that was a really fun game. And I, I think I, I put a tweet out like partway through the first half, but these 16 seeds aren't aren't your father's or your grandfather's 16 seeds, you know? I, I remember watching games 10, 15 years ago and watching a 16 seed and thinking, like, why are they here? Why are they in the tournament? You know, this is terrible, terrible basketball. And you watch these two teams tonight, and it was fun. And they had shot makers. They had playmakers. Um, good defense, especially by Grambling State in that second half. And you understand why they're here. Um, everybody that's in this field is a good team. Now, saying that, Purdue should handle either one of these teams, regardless of which one won tonight. Um, I don't want to say easy, but they should handle either one of these teams. But with that said, like, these are solid teams. Uh, these aren't your uh, 1990, early 2016 seeds anymore. Yeah, I 100% agree. And, and even Grambling State, like, you look at their schedule, and that's just they're in the the SWAC, and what's the teams in the SWAC do is they just schedule gauntlets for non-conference. They take any single buy game that they have. Um, I remember, I think it was last year, I read an article on, I don't remember which specific SWAC team it was, but it was one of them. It was basically like they weren't home for like three weeks straight. Um, it was just buy game after buy game, but it also kind of helps build them for moments like this, and they were down what double they were down double digits in the second half at one point come back force ot um so it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun game i agree purdue like purdue straight up just should they, they should win by probably 20 plus against either of these teams maybe even more we've also seen like like if this was a regular if this was a regular season game purdue would be like favored by 30 right but obviously it's not it's march um and there's just different levels to it so purdue just has to come out uh, put their foot on the gas right away and not let Grambling State even get like a hint of, of momentum. And um, obviously the Purdue is immensely more talented, but anything can happen as we've seen. So um, we can just kind of dive into, I guess, Grambling State in general. 
Um, they are a team. They are ranked 267th in Ken Bomb before this. It'll be updated. They'll be a little bit higher after this game. Um, basically, mainly built on the defensive end. They struggle scoring the ball at times. It has kind of been their MO all year. Uh, a lot of isolations and things like that. But I'll throw it to you, Craig. What is grip? We're, we're going to throw out like, hey, we, we understand that Purdue is the better team. But when you look at this Grambling State team, what are some things that either like concern you or you're like, you'll kind of be looking at for the game on Friday? Yeah. And, you know, I guess, um, like I said, Purdue, Purdue should have handled either one of these teams, regardless of which one they face. And I, I still think they will. Um, but with that said, I think me and you were on opposite ends of the spectrum of like, if we had to pick which team would we rather face? I saw you say something, maybe it was just in a, in a text message yeah. that, that you were leaning more towards hoping that we face Grambling State. And I was kind of on the opposite end of that because I actually thought Montana State was the better team coming into this just in terms of what they do fundamentally, in terms of just basic basketball skill, shot making ability, those sort of things. But to me, there's a great difference in terms of type and style of play that's greater between Grambling State and Purdue. And a team like Montana State to me is a team that that Purdue normally just handles because they do the same things that Montana State does, just way better uh, with bigger players and better athletes. And Grambling State's a little bit different. They're going to go ISO a bunch um, and just like put it in their guys' hands and expect them to go out and make a play. So Purdue's going to have to guard them one on one and. Um, you know, they're going to hunt matchups, I would assume, and they're going to try to pick people out to go out on one-on-one. -on -one. So Purdue's defenders are going to have to step up and they're going to have to stop it. We saw, you know, against North Texas, against St. Peter's, some guys kind of break down some of Purdue's perimeter players one-on-one, -on -one, um, that were lower level teams, uh, but super athletic, quick guards. I don't know as I watched Grambling State that I came away with that same feels like North Texas had some dudes on that team on the perimeter. Like I, I don't look at Grambling State and think they necessarily have the same type of dudes, um, but they're going to have to step up and they're going to have to stop them one on one or, you know, at the same time, if they can't draw Edie out from inside, there's going to be a seven foot four, 290 pound man waiting for him underneath the rim, too. And so that's got, that was kind of. That may change things from what it looked like tonight. Yeah. And, and Purdue, like we we're going to, I'm going to say it again, Purdue should beat either of these teams. I lean Grambling State just of like, there's a few things. Um, one is like, what Montana State just shoots the ball so well. It's one of those that's just like, if Purdue isn't on points on the perimeter guarding them, like I could see Montana State having that first half basically, and where it's just now you're going into the second half basically tied with Purdue. And then it's just like, you don't want to be in that spot. Uh, for Grambling State, like they they do good um, in creating pressure on the perimeter. I do think they're when you look at their raw defensive turnover percentage, I think it's inflated a little bit because their conference as a whole like doesn't know how to take care of the ball. Because um, right now they're 59th in the country in, in turnover percentage, but they are they were in the middle, like just an average team in their conference for forcing turnovers. So like, just want to throw that out there. It's probably a little bit like higher than, than maybe what it would actually look like. Uh, but then on, on when they are on offense, right. Is there, I just don't see how they can keep up scoring with, with Purdue it is more of what it is like, regardless of kind of what they're able to do defensively. Um, I, I just don't see how they're going to have an easy time scoring the ball. They also turn it over a lot. They don't shoot a lot of threes. They don't shoot efficiently at all from interior. And that's usually against somebody not named Zach Eady. Um, like you said, I, I do agree that they're going to try to attack matchups. Lawyer is going to be obviously top of the list when he's in, um, but it's going to be different where, you know, they're, they're two bigs are Aku and, and Jalen Johnson. Like they're just not that big of threats on offense. Um, neither of them can shoot. Neither of them are really going to step out. And just in general, um, there's not too many guys on this team that are going to respect, um, get respect on the perimeter. There's two, maybe three, I would say that are mm, three. I would say three that probably will in some capacity. Uh, but it's just, yeah, I just, it, I don't, uh, I don't see an easy path for Grambling State to keep up with Purdue scoring the ball other than, Hey, we're going to hit hero shot after hero shot. And if that happens, then it is what it is. And you figure it out from there. Um, but that, that's kind of why I was leaning Grambling State, but I totally get the Montana State thing too, of just like Purdue's just better than them of what they do. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I guess, you know, it, if you want a reason to me statistically to look at this game and say there's absolutely no chance that Grambling State can hang with Purdue. Um, it's the amount of offensive rebounds they give up, right? Yes. 
They rank 334th in the country in terms of offensive rebound percentage um, given up to the other team. And that's kind of where Purdue makes its hay. So, like, if you're going to look at that and then, you know, just to kick in on top of that, they rank 221st in terms of free throws given up per field goals attempted. So they're going to foul a decent amount and they're going to give up a crap ton of offensive rebounds. And even if Purdue's not having a great shooting night, just the fact that they can clean the glass up, the fact that they can get to the free throw line ought to lend its way towards a Purdue win uh, in this particular matchup for me. And then also on the defensive end. Um, so Grambling State, they they kind of just limit shots on the perimeter. Um, defensively is what they, they try to do. They don't send a ton of help. They kind of allow almost like how when they go one-on-one on offense, on defense, they allow one-on-one. They're also just like really bad at defending the rim. Um, that's just not a strength for them at all. They're not good at defending in the rim, in the paint. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's also part of it too, of like, you're going to, they're either going to let Edie get 35 points or they're going to triple team them. And then it just purely comes down to when we think about the FDU, it's, can you knock down a jumper? And I trust this team to knock down more jumpers. I, I, I'm so much more confident in that. And I think that's the big thing too. Um, with this is just like there's just so many more options for Purdue to score not only in this game obviously but just in general Brain can get his Lance we know can go for 20 on any night um, even Fletch and, and just guys off the bench too so um, let's where do we want to go I don't know we didn't really talk ahead how we want to do this we <laughs> no. want to do like well I was just gonna say on the like not giving up a bunch of threes and whatnot like Looking statistically uh, before this game and just watching a little bit of tape, I would kind of agree with you. And then I watched tonight and I was like, man, Montana State was getting wide open looks left and right for a while there and just missing some of those wide open looks. They hit a bunch in the first half, uh, but they still got plenty of looks. So I don't, you know, they're going to have to figure out how they want to try to contain Zach. And they're, you know, we've seen time and time again, um, these smaller teams, kind of throw out the window maybe what they normally do defensively when they play Purdue. So obviously you wonder just coming into this game, are they going to toss everything? I don't want to say everything out the door, but are they going to toss a lot of what they do out the door and just try to completely attack Zach? And if they do, um, probably going to give up a lot of wide open threes on top of that. Go ahead. And then it's simply just making them. But uh, I yeah. think their coach's exact quote was, we're going to throw the backyard at Zach Eady is what the coach said after the game. Okay. So not just the kitchen sink, the whole backyard as well. Um, I'm trying to find this stat really quick because I forget if it was them or Montana State as I was prepping, and now it's not loading. Yeah. Um, so Okay, so one, in terms of the post, uh, Grambling State just doesn't face a ton of post-ups. They faced, played 100, faced 110 this entire season. I don't know. I can look it up, but Zach Eady has a lot more than 110 himself <laughs> on the entire season. Um, and out of those, they've trapped, it says, 19 times. Um, and so basically what my point is, is like they're going to probably try to z- trap Zach Eady, right? That's just what's going to happen. Can it work? Absolutely. And, and they do are they are a good team of getting in passing lanes and stuff like that. But at the same time, they are now going to have to implement that post trap within 48 hours. Um, can it be done? Absolutely. But at the same time, that, that's a tough thing to do. Uh, and it's just, especially in just shut, such short prep. And that's where it's kind of the benefit that Purdue gets a play in where it's just like, if I'd rather have painter on, on short prep than a team trying to prep against Purdue, um, was a little annoying in terms of prepping for me for this, but <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll sacrifice a little bit for them. Um, what was the other, there was one other thought I had. Did you let me ask you this? Because like there was a lot of talk about Grambling State defense coming into this or just what they look like statistically on paper. Also, just watching the game, I know they forced some more turnovers in the second half, but I did not get a feel of like, oh, their guards put a ton of hardcore perimeter pressure. Like you think about Rutgers when they have elite defense, or you think about uh what some of Northwestern's guards more last year than this year probably do uh to Purdue on the perimeter, like there was never a point where I was watching tonight and I'm like, oh, that is that is super intense ball pressure on the perimeter that's really going to bother Braden out there on top. And that's where, because when I was watching film of them earlier today, I, I kind of had that same thought. I was just like, man, they're like this team that should be forcing a lot of turnovers, but it's like, I, I don't get quite how they do it. Um, and I think that relates a little bit back to like their conference just turns it over. 
Um, I think they, they showed it a little bit more in the second half, like you said, of they have the ability to do it. It just doesn't seem like it's as consistent maybe as you kind of expect from a team with this kind of statistical profile, um, for lack of a better word. But um, no, I agree. This is at the end of the day, if Purdue takes care of the ball, they'll, they'll definitely they like they'll win this game. Um, and they should. Braden's much, much better at just taking care of the ball, whether it be in pick and roll. And they're not a great team defending the pick and roll. They're just okay at, at, in general. Like Edie should eat. And then if you knock down just even a few threes, like even just a, I mean, an average day, I guess, for Purdue is 40%. But even get like a 33% night from three on decent volume should be enough for Purdue. Um, let's dive in, I guess, a little bit into what off- Grambling State does offensively as they, they're they going to ISO a lot. And we talked about that a little bit. Um, I'm trying to, what's the, trying to pull up the exact stats from this game. Burnett had 18 for them. Smith had 18. Kofer had 19. Steve that was Smith wild. Had, yeah. <laughs> cause like Kofer, he didn't really pop up at all on my scouting report. Yeah. Cause he's played before tonight. He played 24 minutes in the past since like basically since February, he's played like 40 minutes total before tonight. Um, comes off the bench, goes crazy. There are a bunch of dudes that are going to ISO and they'll, they'll run some pick and rolls and they'll run, they, they like running this kind of staggered pin down look. Um, but I guess go to you who or what about their offense. If you did have to pick a concern with Purdue is they're going to be aside from purely matchup hunting. Aside from purely matchup hunting. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's what scares me the most is <laughs> like yeah. if they're just going to try to, and I don't think I need to say it um, where they're going to try to maybe get that matchup uh, with Purdue starting lineup and, and whether Purdue will be able to stop them one way or another out there. I, I think obviously they will. And the fact that Zach's standing back there behind him, I didn't, there wasn't a lot today that was like, Oh, they're going to pull up and hit a bunch of 10, eight to 10 footers. Right. Yeah. To me, they seem like guys that want to go ISO and, and try to get within three feet of the rim and score. And, Having Zach back there to anchor that defense, I, I think, is going to be really good. Um, I I mean, their star didn't show up tonight, really. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, to me, that was the biggest thing. As I'm watching tonight, I'm like, man, nothing, nothing that I looked up on this team in terms of, like, who was supposed to be doing what offensively really rang true in this game. So, it seemed a little bit like an outlier to me. I don't know how it felt to you. No, I agree with that because uh, Dozier is, is their guy, and he had six points six points on three and nine shooting. Their other guy's uh, Moden at, at number five, and he was three for 12. Now he did have six assists as well. And this is, yeah, I, I think they're just – what they've done for a lot is out of those games that I've watched is just they're just going to drive, drive, drive. They're going to try to get downhill as much as possible. That does bring in the, the foul potentials and all of that as they are also a team that draws a lot of fouls, um, and we, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, but that's just what they want to do. They want to drive, they want to drive, they want to drive, but they also aren't that good at like efficient at finishing at the rim. Um, and this is where Edie does, Edie has to stay out of foul trouble, but also impose his will and, and kind of just balance that out. Also just hopefully like, I think the hope is he could be aggressive because this game can be put away in 20 minutes and it doesn't matter if he's maybe in foul trouble at the 25 minute mark, because he might not come back in the rest of the game it is obviously the ideal world there. Um, I, you know, just, I oh, yeah. I think Jordan Smith as a six foot seven guard. He put up 18 points tonight, and I, I thought he attacked uh, really well at different points in times tonight. Shoot six for ten. So, uh, you know, as kind of you're looking at that lineup one through five, I somebody has that's to guard him. six foot one or shorter in our starting lineup is going to have to guard him. Now, maybe if he starts going off, maybe that means more Morton minutes. Maybe that means more Heidi minutes. Um, but I, I guess for me, that's maybe the matchup issue out of these particular five. Yeah, I agree. Um, to, I agree to an extent because the, the other, like, I guess it depends on what Jordan Smith is, is going to be there um, because he went two for two from three today. In his past three games, he is now six for eight from three. Um, and aside from that on the year, he is five for 30. So he's been on kind of this heater these past few games scoring the ball. If that Jordan Smith coach shows up, then that is where the issue is a little bit. Um, who is because they start they start Burnett usually too, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And and he's, six, and he's six foot five and listed as a forward. Yeah. And uh, that's where. <laughs> go ahead. It's where just like he's, but he's just beefier, and, and Smith yeah. is a little bit thinner in that, so they might try to stick lawyer on him. Um, what were you gonna say? 
I wasn't. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think if he's, he's come on strong these last few games, he really has. So he'll be the guy. And then it, I assume Lance is just going to start on Dozier because that is their guy. If not, he starts on Moden would be my guess. And brain takes the other. Yeah. So, um, and then that, and then that, that leaves Fletch for Jordan Smith. It leaves TKR for Burnett's and then Edie for Aku. Um, that feels pretty right. And then Aku's not a shooter. He hasn't even attempted a three all year. Um, he's also shooting 46% from the free throw line. So like Edie's probably just going to almost one man zone down there, I assume. Yeah. So I, I would feel like that. So, yeah. and even like, and then I want to go back to TKR, I guess, because I think that's where it's like TKR is kind of, you know, he's got into this role where he's 15 to 17 minutes a game. Um, and he maybe doesn't have the most offensive production at the moment in large part, because there's this guy named Zach Edie that plays pretty much the same position as him. Um, but if, if, Grambling State's going to sell out on Edie. It just feels like a TKR can go to work type game of we're going to get TKR one on one coverage because they're not going to want to double off of Zach. Um, and he should, like, he's going to have the size advantage over literally whoever's guarding him except for Aku. And Aku's not going to guard him. Um, so this, that's where I want to go back to. Like, I, I think if TKR can stay on defensively, I assume he'll be on Burnett's unless he'll be on Smith. Stay out of foul trouble, which will be the big thing out of that because, like, both of those guys want to drive. I feel like it could be a 15 plus. Uh, that feels a lot. I'll stick with it. I think it could be like a 15 point game from TKR. Like, I really I mean, do. I mean, if they sell out on Zach, yeah. Yes. And that's um, what my, my premise is on. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm yeah, I don't, I think just as you look at this team up and down, they really only have one guy that I think can somewhat defend the post, but they're not going to do like, they can't do that one-on-one. -on -one. There's no way. They can look at this game and say that they're going to put Aku on on Ed one on one, and Zach's shown the ability to hit TKR off that you know kind of backside cut um, coming down if he does get doubled or he can kick out either one. Uh, but also we've seen Painter multiple times this year, even at the start of games, like right off the jump, just kind of I don't want to say use Zach as a decoy, but kind of use Zach as a little bit of a decoy and just feed TKR like two or three possessions like right off the jump and. Um, it one and I think he does that right partially to be like, hey, like if this was your game plan, we got this other dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I it would not shock me at all to see that. Oh, David, it was was this probably had to be right about the time that I was starting on it. It was David Dillman yeah. says any chance Purdue draws things up for TKR in the post with the expected double against Edie. I promise you, I did not see that chat till now, but um, we were thinking the same thing right there, David. I, I we do think so, like. Or there's at least a possibility of it. It would make sense. Um, and then you can bring in Gillis and, and run your, you know, you're going to get a bunch of threes up that way. Um, yeah, either one. And Gillis should feast in this game if they are going to sell out on Zach. And I think we've just seen over and over again, whether it's Braden, Zach, Fletch, Lance, depending on who's on from outside that given day, or even if it's Cam Heidi, uh, we might have another random Cam Heidi, like <laughs> be on fire from outside. There's, there's enough guys or, you know, this year compared to last year, right? Um, the option when Purdue wasn't hitting threes, when FDU just completely sold out on Zach. Three, right? Legitimately three guys on him, yes. Right. Your your option was, right, Eth, I guess, was Ethan starting? Did Ethan start that game? He either start, He played like 20 minutes, I'm pretty sure. Right. There, there was no Miles Colvin sitting on the bench that was shooting 38% that has no fear. <laughs> like, yeah. And... Do I think Miles Coleman plays a significant role in this game? I have no idea. Um, you know, tendency would say based on minutes played over the last 15 games, probably not. But if for whatever reason there's some guys who played in this game last year against FDU that come out tight and they just need somebody to come in and bury threes, you got a dude on the bench that can come in and fire away and shoot 38% that has nothing in his head about what happened last year at all. True. I mean, and he'll have, if he misses his first, he'll have nothing in his head still. And, and, um, that's where that is the one scenario where it's like, right. Is if say Purdue comes out slow and they're, they're missing threes is Purdue just has to flip that switch that we know they have. Um, at times I, I especially lately, they've kind of let teams hang around early and then being able to pull it away a little bit. Um, but this team just doesn't feel like that with Lance Jones. Fletch is much more confident. You have, like you said, Colvin off the bench. Even Heidi will come in and he'll, you know, especially if Heidi can make that first one, then kind of it's it's all things go from there for him. 
Um, Gillis has shot insanely, insanely well this year compared. I mean, Gillis was shooting 35% from three last year, and that's in large part because he went nine for 12 in a game. Like if you took that out, he was like 31% or 32%. He's shooting 48% this year um, on basically the same volume. Like there's just, these dudes are just so much more confident if they do sell out on needy that like you have either Tikiar on the other post or you have these shooters or the other thing is, and um, for anybody that hasn't watched, there's a video kind of breaking down Purdue um, by Hoop Vision 68, Jordan Sperber. It's Ho- Hoop Vision 68 on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Really great mm-hmm. breakdown. He's also just, he's like my personal favorite uh, college basketball like media person ever. Um, but he does a good job breaking down uh, of the game. And one of the things is like in the FDU game last year, Brainsmith hit a pull up jumper out of pick and roll the very first possession and did not the rest of the game. They have that this time. They, they, Braden, Braden will be there. I, everything, I know there's been some chats asking if he's been healthy. I think. Uh, painter said he's fine well whether fine means 80 percent or 100 percent, who actually knows but 80 percent brain should be good enough in this game get to his pull up it's going to be there or get downhill um and that's the other like that's just probably the the piece we haven't talked about enough is what Braden can do offensively this year compared to last it just makes this team so much more dynamic yeah and just how much more i mean they started to do it more and more and more as the year we're on last year but i do you have numbers on the difference in like uh pick and roll percentage from this year to last year by chance off the top of your head? Cause not off the top of my head, but I can find it really quick. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, it just seems like that has been, it, it was there last year, but it, to the level that it is this year, I, I think that has just increased so much. And I think in this particular type of game or like that FDU game last year, where you bring, bring Zach out high and you get him rolling to the rim instead of trying to just force feed him with, two guys sitting there ready to mob them um, off the back. I think that adds a, a significantly different element just in terms of how comfortable Braden is with that and his <clears throat> like newfound commitment to if you're going to turn your body, if you're going to turn your head, I'm going to the rim at that point. Like, yep. I'm going to go ahead and make you pay and I'm going to burn you for it. So last year uh, on this, this is, so this is pick and art, pick and rolls, specifically including passes as well so like kickouts for three or whatever that was last year was around 20 percent of possessions this year's up to 25 percent um and then in terms of just the ball handler scoring last year it was nine percent nine and a half percent this year it's up to 13 percent of possessions um so there's just that is there is that bump and obviously purdue is still very very heavy post up but Edie also should be able to get his if the ball is there even even if it's a delayed double like if Edie catches the ball and it isn't an automatic double I assume he can just get his anyways then. Um, but yeah, pick and roll numbers definitely are up. Gives another dynamic to this offense right there. Um, was there somewhere else you kind of wanted to go right now? I, I don't know. We can go On through the- more of the individual players. <clears throat> we could go through more big picture stuff. I'd rather go more big picture stuff. I didn't. I was so convinced Montana State was going to win that game. I was taking a bunch of notes on Montana State uh, <laughs> as I was watching. Like, I was dead. Even when it went to overtime, I was like, oh, Montana State's going to close this out. Like, they just look like the better team to me. But um, I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, unless you have specific things you want to talk about in terms of matchups one-on-one with Grambling State guys. Um, No, I think we've covered it all. Like, at the end of the day, Purdue is the better team, and it is, like – um. It, it is, I guess this kind of leads into the big picture thing. We all know what happened last year. And there's been a couple comments of like, do you guys remember last year? Like, yes, we remember last year, the FDU loss. Uh, yeah, obviously. Um, this team is different. We've said that all year. It is now time for them to take that final step of proving why they're different. I think they've proved it already. Even just in some of the ways that they've won games, you've seen even like, right. They, they lose to Ohio States and everybody's like, Oh, this is the February fall off. That's just what happens to Purdue. They're bad, all that stuff. And they turn around and they win. And maybe it wasn't as decisive. They, right. Um, they definitely weren't playing as well as maybe November, but at the same time, they've just, they've shown that they can win in different ways. Um, and this is step one. And step one is coming out, beating a team you should beat by 25 and doing it. Um, it is giving Grambling State zero hope, um, putting just basically from the tip, you, you're up 10 to two or something. And Grambling State's like, yeah, we have we have no chance of winning this. Um, I'm, obviously, that's not a guarantee, but I, I do. I truly do think that happens of we're about 10, 15 minutes in the game. And then I'm going to look over at Craig and be like, well, um, I think Purdue's going to win this one. Yeah. And I I mean, 
that's what needs to happen. They need to get it from the jump. They need to put no doubt because we know in NCAA tournament time, although with this being an indie, I don't know that that's going to be true. True. But who, whoever is in the building um, that's not a Purdue fan, you, you know they're going to root for the underdog. So you want to jump out. You want to kind of put their foot on their throat as fast as you possibly can. And I think obviously we've seen Purdue that do that quite a bit this year. I think also as people talk about uh, February, like there's a lot of things statistically that just those comments make absolutely no sense to me. Um, whether you look at their three point shooting from last year to this year and like, did it go down some? Yes, but it never like even remotely came close to the low points of what last year was. Like I said, I think there was at one point in the season, I had looked it up and there was like six or seven times Purdue had shot under 20%. And I don't think Purdue shot under 20% once this year. I think their low was 26%, if I remember right, the last time that I looked. From three? Yep. Another stat yeah. that just kind of jumps out, and I can't remember. 20, who... They've shot 23% against Gonzaga, 26 against Rutgers mm -hmm. and Northwestern. They've been under 30% right. seven times this entire season. And that was, like, a few of those games you just mentioned were relatively early on. Those weren't late. The latest that the, the latest that they shot under 30 percent from three was february 4th um and there's only been yeah there's only been two games in the year of 20 or uh, three games in the year of 2024 that they've shot under 30 percent from three right and i i forget who put it out um but they pulled the stats uh from torvik and it's basically like a volatility score that shows like what your range is in terms of how well you play from a scoring state offensive scoring standpoint from one game to the next and purdue has one of the best scores in the entire tournament in terms of just they're going to play close to their level every single time that they go out yeah yeah no i did i saw that stat too they're like the least variance out of the teams all in the midwest um and for good reason like even their bad games the only the only game where it was just like man purdue didn't have any sort of chance was that nebraska game and even then like the score is a 16 point game. They had multiple chances in that second half to try and take a lead, just weren't able to. Um, every other, like they've played what, 33 games so far this season, and 32 of them, they had a legitimate, legitimate um, chance to, to win. And they won 29 of them, hopefully pick up win number 30. About, you know, we're, we're getting towards, I would say, the end of the show. We'll talk a little bit more big picture, but we should give a um, shout out to our sponsor, Autograph. Yeah, and as we talk about Autograph, uh, so happy that we're in this partnership with them in terms of promoting what they do over there. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's a relatively new app, guys, and it just centralizes all of your sports content that you want to see based on the teams that you choose to see um, in terms of blogs, in terms of podcasts, whatever it is that's out there. You can get that all centralized into one specific place. And just by reading or listening to that content, you can get rewarded for it, have a chance to win either super low price tickets or even free experiences to NCAA tournament elite eight type games. They've already given away uh, sets of tickets this week to the first round and second round games at true fan pricing for $16 a ticket. And very, very soon they're going to be giving away a pair of free tickets to the round of 32 in Indianapolis. So pay attention to that. All you have to do is scan the code Download the Autograph app and refer a friend. And that friend has to sign up by noon tomorrow. But if you do those things, you have an opportunity to claim one pair of absolutely free tickets to the round of 32 in Indy. Um, those things are always first come, first serve. There's not a lot of them out there. The thing that I see the most is, well, I, I didn't get them and they went so fast. Well, there's a whole lot of people who are Purdue fans that are on that app and they want it. So there's going to be some just random chance and, and how quick you can get in there to get those types of deals and get those types of tickets. But nobody else is putting those type of things out there for you uh, just to reward you for the things that you're doing already in terms of consuming Purdue content. So would highly recommend uh, that you go do that. I know they're looking right now. It's securing. They've already got a Elite Eight VIP experience set up, and they're trying to secure some Final Four tickets. So there's going to be even more opportunity out there for you to get rewarded for being a fan. So yeah, um, use code Bits. Sign up. We'll throw the QR code up right now. They are now for sure on Android as well. So Apple, Android, whatever 
device do you have? Um, really appreciate working with them, being sponsored with them. So um, the other thing we have to shout out is our meetup. Um, Craig, you know about this, I assume? No, you might not. I don't think I <laughs> no, I, that, I, to be honest. I kind of thought about that as I was saying, and I was like, well, um, do we actually, do we know where it is yet? Uh, there's like a Hooters near the stadium, and that's where I think Brad's kind of decided it was going to be uh, because he wants he's just worried about space. So um, I'm trying to find exactly where it's at right now. Did I he have this up? Does, does he have something reserved, or we're just gonna like? Roll I think we're just gonna. And... <laughs> that's. I think if you guys do are actually thinking of going, can you throw it in the comment? Because we are trying to see like or, if there are people that are going to come. Um, That'd be great. Love to meet you, hang out, um, watch some hoops for a bit. So 2 p.m. Eastern is kind of when we're planning. It'll be for the Western Kentucky versus Marquette game. Um, 25th West Georgia Street, Indianapolis. That is pretty, cl- I believe that's pretty close to the stadium. I should know that, but off the top of my head, but I don't. Bragg um, said he texted you the, the info. Yeah, I have it pulled up too. I gotcha. Um, I gotcha. Yeah, 2 p.m. Eastern, 25th West Georgia Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. Come hang out for a little bit. Um, and just, you know, meet us, um, hang out with you guys should be a good time as we enjoy some hoops. And then shortly after that, obviously will be the, uh, Purdue game, which will be a lot of fun. So, yeah. uh, And for anybody coming, Joe will be standing at the door with his whiteboard and he will draw you instructions of how to get back to the rest of the boilers and the stands crew. Yep. Um, (laughs) sure. (laughs) So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, if we find out more details or, or figure out more exact details about like spacing and all that stuff too, we'll, we'll definitely throw that out. But that is the plan right now. Um, also, if you want to, if you forget the info and, and you were wondering, follow us on boilers and stands. We have a post up um, detailing all the info 2 PM Eastern 25th West Georgia street. So should be fun. Hope to see you guys there. Um, in terms of, I guess we're going to keep it big picture at this point and then carry on with the show. Purdue has to get past the first round, obviously. Duh. Past that, though, what are, you know, I don't know if you've gotten to look into TCU Utah State at all. Um, I really personally haven't that much. Um, To be honest, I have not been able to even fill out my bracket yet. Um, It is something I plan on doing after the show. But do you have any thoughts on them or, or the Midwest region as a whole or just even, you know, Purdue as a team, kind of what they need to do? Um, for anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I think as you look at TCU and Utah State, right, I, I think there's as much of a stylistic difference as what we saw in the the two sixteen seeds tonight in terms of what Purdue might eventually face, right? Um, if you want to talk about adjusted tempo, <clears throat> um, TCU ranks 65th in that. Have some really quick guards out there. If you guys remember Jameer Nelson, um, his son, uh, is on the team on this specific team a really high quality point guard um they will get into purdue a little bit in terms of force and turnovers um they rank 22nd in the country uh defensively forcing turnovers so from that standpoint i think it presents an interesting dynamic we just talked about variance a little bit ago this is a very very high variance tcu team Um, They can go out and look really, really good one day. They can go out and look absolutely terrible and just get drilled by somebody that on paper looks like a similar opponent the next. So, I mean, I I think they'll get up and I think they'll run. I think they'll make things a little bit more up-tempo and fast-paced. I don't know just in terms of a big man factor whether they have anybody. I, I mean, we could just say that about any team in the country, right? Like, True. individually one-on-one i don't know that anybody has anyone that is going to match up against sack if we look at their major contributors they go six two six seven six eight six two six eight like in terms of guys that that score a lot of points uh for that team uh if you want to reference that from kim palm uh so i don't know that they have somebody that's truly going to stop zach out there but i guess that's my initial read on them i don't know if you've got to watch them at all this year or look into them statistically one way or another yeah, I've, I've watched one game of them, um, and it is a lot of what she said. They're going to try to get into guards. Um, they want to speed up the game offensively, they, but defensively, they're fine turning it into a grind if they don't get a turnover right away. In terms of matchup, they probably are the tougher matchup than Utah State. Um, but you know, I'm just kind of looking through Utah State because I that's kind of the from what everything that I've heard, right? This even with this being a one to two point spread is like 
I don't, I've never, I haven't seen like anybody pick Utah State um, at all. And they seem a little bit, probably a little bit more balanced um, just as a team of not solely relying on the defense always. They aren't like an elite offense. They don't shoot the ball well, but they do attack the interior great. They are also a little bit, um, a little bit smaller, except for its center. They do have like a seven footer that will play. Um, they also have Ian Martinez, anybody that remembers him from Maryland last year. This is where he's transferred. He's actually had a pretty good year for them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, TCU could probably give Purdue a little bit more trouble. At the end of the day, I still tr- like, I still, tr- I'm going to trust this Purdue team against literally anybody in the country. So it's maybe stating the obvious, but like, I, I still think that neither of these have, like, neither of these teams are as good as Purdue. Um, and it comes out to what you do, obviously, in one game. But both of them, I, I think Purdue, like, should, I don't want to say take care of because they could be close, but should win. And then you, like, you look at the the four, I mean, the 413 and the 512 in the Midwest is like two of the most common upsets I think I've seen out of like everybody. Like, I, I think a lot of people legitimately have Samford versus uh, McNeese State in that 1213. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, or just, yeah, any of those matchups, I guess? I mean, <laughs> I, I guess for me personally, anybody who's followed uh, coverage throughout the year, I've said it since Maui, that I thought Canvas, Kansas was terribly overrated to start this season. And the only reason I thought they beat Tennessee in Maui was because Tennessee had to play the style that they play for three days in a row. And Kansas just really lacks three-point shooting in terms of any predictability from there. Uh, Furphy kind of got on a little bit of a streak at some point in this season and, and relieved that pressure from outside a little bit, but that hasn't carried through, um, through the entire season. You add in there that, um, you know, essentially a potential all American is injured and out for the year in McCuller. I, I would give me Kansas all friggin' day long, all day. Yeah, I would, I wouldn't mind Kansas. I, I feel comfortable really against any of the four, um, Again, I, I think this is a good draw for Purdue. I, I really do think it is. Um, you know, even if Sanford, like if, because I've seen the jokes of like, you know, Sanford is going to be the team that beats them, like if they make the Sweet 16 or whatever. But it's like Purdue beat Sanford by 43 this year. Um, <laughs> and I understand that was the very first game of the year and teams can improve and teams are different. But like, it's not like, it's, this is just, it's not like Purdue is going to lose to a low seed automatically. Um, and there's a good chance that Purdue plays. There's a chance that they play a 16, a nine, and like a 12 or 13 in their first three games. Like, it is a realistic chance. The McNeese State versus Gonzaga game will be interesting. We already beat Purdue. Already beat Gonzaga once this year. Um, they beat him last year too. Also, though that doesn't really matter for this year. But um, yeah, I, I think this the top half is pretty favorable. The bottom half is just kind of like you play who you play at that point. I mean, you could sure you could like wish for certain teams or whatever, but it's it's one of those that's like. I, I almost hope we play Tennessee and the fact that like, that means we're in the elite eight, you know, same thing with like UConn or Houston or whoever it's like, that means you're, you made it that far. And then it's a one game you figure it out from there. Um, yeah. I don't know. Do you have anything on the bottom half in general? Cause I don't really have too much other than like, I hope we play one of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if I'm looking at that bottom half for me, I think Texas and Tennessee are the two toughest matchups out of that bottom half. Texas is a seven. Um, In reality, um, as I look at TCU, just in terms of the fact that TCU has that really high variance. And if you catch TCU on one of their good days, um, there's a piece of me that thinks that TCU matchup really may be the most difficult matchup they face until, unless they get Tennessee um, in that elite eight game. I'm Creighton does not scare me at all. Um, Crane's a popular I pick. I good, good for them. Um, I, I most of the year I thought Creighton was fraudulent, um, playing in a Big East that I thought was incredibly weak after the top three. Not that the Big Ten was incredibly strong after their top two, um, but I thought a lot of what they did was was built on the fact that the Big East was was pretty down in the bottom half of that conference this year. And then they came out. And I think they did. They beat Marquette towards the end of the year, right? Like on the road or something and did something. And I was like, okay, that was a good win. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. They also, they beat UConn at home by 20. That's what it was. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, but like, what's Kalkbrenner going to, a lot of what Creighton does is build off. I mean, they have dynamic guards and they have dynamic three point shooters. 
But nonetheless, a lot of what Creighton do is build off what Calkburner can do. And like he's not going to do anything against Zach at all. So I think Purdue will be able to focus up top on the perimeter more. Um, and I'm just, yeah, that one doesn't worry me. Tennessee worries me. Playing Tennessee a second time. Ziegler, now that he's back and healthy and is actually a contributor. Um, that one worries me a little bit more about going at them a second time. Texas, just, I don't know why. Tech, there's something about Texas just stylistically in terms of how they play, in terms of putting pressure, uh, perimeter pressure on guards and that sort of stuff that always worries me a little bit. Um, yeah, that's, yeah I Ace guess Ace that's where I sit. Yeah. Ace Miss can just go for four, or 30 any night. Um, right. Yeah, I don't have too much. Like I said, like I've, I've been very busy making these previews and stuff. Um, and I, I, I've been looking forward to tonight because it was like the time I'm, I've set aside of like, I'm going to go through the brackets, pick all the wrong games and have fun doing it. So we have a few comments. Um, yeah. I think we can go. Well, through I, I mean, for anybody listening, if you're like, man, these guys weren't looking ahead at the second, third, fourth rounds that were only worried about the first round. That was supposed to be Braggs's job tonight. Like he was going to be the expert analyst on round two, round three, round four. And then something came up with him and he couldn't come on the show. So that's that's the only reason we're a little bit underprepared on round two, three, and four. Yep. Also, I'm I'm seeing a few comments too of just like basically don't overlook round one. Um, <laughs> we did not do that. We spent a good chunk on Grambling State, which will be Friday 725 Eastern time tip. Sounds roughly right. Um, I'm gonna pull up the exact time now because it'll bug me if I don't. 725 Eastern time. I nailed that. Um, do you have anything else big picture, whether it be Purdue or if you want to even comment any big 10 teams, if not, we can get to some of these comments and then get out of here. <laughs> Braggs Braggs commented. Uh, yeah, I'll be home to do two more hours with everyone. Hashtag expert. We would not expect anything less from um, our, our resident college basketball expert Braggs. So um, looking forward to that from him. Do you have anything um, if you want like an, a chance to talk any other big 10 teams, uh, you can go for it now if you want. Um, if not, we can get to some comments and get out of here. Yeah, let's let's roll to the comments. All right. A um, few comments. This one from Facebook user. How do you think the officiating may or may not change for Zach in the tournament? You had a reaction, so I'm going to throw it to you first. I was over there. Uh, oh. <laughs> I was starring another comment, but... Um, with that said, it, it's been highlighted a few different times. Um, officiating wasn't the issue in that game last year. The issue yeah. was missing three-point shots. If you look at, in terms of what Purdue averages from fouls, in terms of fouls drawn by Zach, all that sort of stuff, that wasn't an outlier game um, in, in terms of how it was officiated. There were Big Ten refs, a quote, okay? Guys who, there are no such thing as Big Ten refs, but there are guys who refed in the Big Ten, who had refed Zach Eady that year, who called that game. Um, that wasn't the issue. The issue was guys not being able to hit wide open three-pointers in that game. The issue was a, a few too many turnovers. Um, I don't think it changes. I, I really don't. And I, I saw somebody put up a statistic not too long ago in terms of games played outside a conference compared to the Big Ten. And there were actually more fouls called, more fouls drawn by Zach Eady on a percentage basis than in the Big Ten. So I, that whole narrative to me is just a bunch of effing bullshit. Like, um, so, excuse my French, but it, it's just, it's this narrative that people like to take off and run with because teams foul Zach a bunch and people don't like watching Zach get fouled a bunch. But that's not on Zach, man. Like, that's how teams decide we can't stop him so chris collins i've got 20 fouls to use and i'm gonna throw yep. them all out there at him like and they're gonna call them they're gonna yep. call them <laughs> yeah when we look at the the non-conference games i'm gonna take out the buy games because minutes and all that stuff against xavier 17 attempts this is just zach Eady. against xavier 17 attempts gonzaga 16 tennessee 10 um which is shocking but he did only play 26 minutes marquette 19 Alabama 20, Arizona 15. Um, he's going to get fouled. He's going to get free throws. It's going to come down to him not committing fouls and, and staying out of foul trouble. And then everything else that we've talked about in this game with the three point shooting and Braden and TKR and all that stuff. 
Um, did you have anything else on officiating? I do not. I just okay. I, I I want that narrative to to die. I'm just so sick of it. I mean, if Purdue wins, it will increase. Um, or if Purdue loses, Wait, it'll increase. Dude, if, if Purdue wins, I will invite it. Like, bring it on. I won't care because I'm yeah. gonna be walking around holding a replica friggin' banner. Um, God, what was that movie? You're too young for this. There was a movie with uh, Cusack where he's holding like a boombox up outside of a window. That's going to be me. I'm just going to walk up to every opposing fan base with a national championship Purdue banner and hold it up outside until they look. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, from Drake Cobbs, he says, I think we see some zone. And Grambling State will. Um, they will zone at times. I'm, I can try to find the exact percentage. but like, I, even I think he scouting, means that will zone. Yeah, so Grambling State, they zone. Um, <laughs> and uh yeah 27 percent of defensive possessions they play zone um and we will see that they press a little bit not too too much um if they do zone then it's going to be even more important than ever that purdue guys knock down some threes um that is my take on the zone comments for this game do you have anything i do not think we see zone i think we saw it a total of maybe a minute and a half this year there was one like game Four possessions this se this season. Four possessions. Um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if they're just cooking one-on-one uh, -on -one for a little bit, maybe Painter throws it out there as just like a look um, to see whether it does something. But four possessions out of however many possessions were, were played 2, this year. 2,591. Yeah. Not a real good trend line to say that we're going to see Purdue play zone in this game. I will. I, I do want to, in, in all seriousness, like even Painter's willingness to go to it, even if it's four possessions, I think it just shows a little bit of like he's just not stubborn. Like he, I think a knock on him from from previous years is that he's stubborn and is going to coach his way. I um, mean, obviously, he still has all of his principles and stuff, but like the dude just wants to win. Like no, and, and we can all be in here and, and argue with stuff. And like, there is not a single person more than probably than Matt Painter that wants Purdue to win. Um, it, it's as simple as that. So, uh, from Dick Stillwagon, spread is set at twenty five and a half. So yeah, I think Ken Palm had it at twenty three from what I saw. Um, so what should be expected? And it's like Purdue. I don't know if they cover, but they should be right there to cover. They, 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 that's just what they've done to these bad non-conference uh, teams this year. They, they just dominate yeah. them. Dick, take that second mortgage out. Put it all on the boilers. I think you're good to roll. Do I'm not take gonna... that as actual advice from a legal <laughs> yeah. perspective. I was just going to disclaimer. We are not <laughs> experts. Don't actually take our advice. <laughs> yeah. um, from SLK. Oops. <clears throat> okay. I accidentally unstarted the comments, but I <laughs> I like double clicked on accident. I, I it's from, I, I'm it's, not going back and finding that. I, I know what I know what it said. It's from SLK Boiler, and he said, "Do we think it's going to be 80 percent Purdue fans tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but Friday in Indy?" Oh, that's what she or they meant. I thought it meant like, "Will Purdue be 80 percent health?" But that no. makes way that makes way more sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I yeah. I think there's a really good chance it'll be 80% Purdue, right? Because sessions. So who's in the other session with us? TCU and Utah State, right? Yeah, that's the other game in our session. I don't see. Actually, TCU travels pretty well. I don't remember where I was. I was somewhere not too long ago that TCU was playing. And uh, oh yeah, no they yeah they they played Clemson. Yeah. They didn't travel like Purdue fans, um, but I still think they'll travel relatively well. It's a really good question because, I mean, that's sectioned out the four, basically four fan bases for that session. And it just depends on how well everybody else travels. But I don't think you're going to get a huge contingent. There's going to be a pretty big third party market um, for in terms of the team that we face, Grambling State. But it just depends on how well TCU and Utah State travel, I guess. Yep. I I maybe not quite 80%, but 70% would make or even just like the game's gonna start and out of the total fans there, it's gonna be like 80% Purdue. Um, and maybe it's just not full capacity. And then by the time that second session rolls in, some of the other fans roll in, um, it'll be less Purdue because whoever is TCU, like whoever, whatever shows up for TCU Utah State will be rooting hard against Purdue. 
And so that's where Purdue just needs to put the game away. Don't allow anything um, to, to even happen or, or anything at all even come close. From you, I said, also, we're coming off a loss. Coming off our previous three losses, we've beaten teams by 17, 18, and 19. We will be pissed. That's... So that the 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 it's basically true, except we've beaten teams by 17, 19, and 28. So maybe it was a typo. Maybe it's supposed to be 17, 28, and 19. Yeah. Either way, Purdue, like that's just what they do. Granted, all those games were home games. Um, they all were against Big Ten teams. They were all home games, but like we said, this should be more this should be a pseudo home game for Purdue. It, it really should. Um from from Tariq Kamel. Tarek. Said, Tarek. Tarek. What? Tarek. Tarek, my bad. That is my Tarek Kamel. Seriously, why not sit Edie and Smith and see what happens through the first five minutes and continue without them if it isn't working? Um, I, no. I, he's been Tarek, Tarek has been um, concerned with the injuries, and, and I get that. But at the same time, you play if you play Edie and Smith, and hopefully you can just put them away in the first twenty minutes, and then they still just play 15, 20 minutes that game, um, and then you get some rest going into the next one. Would be kind of my take on that. Yeah, flip that. So play them to start, get a big lead, send them down after that. Um, like the infamous uh, Herm Edwards said, we play to win the game. I think that was Herm Edwards. I don't, I don't really remember for sure. Um, but no, that wasn't Herm Edwards. That was the Colts' uh, old coach. But anyway, uh, Mora, we play to win the game. Uh, but anyway, I, I think you have to roll with your guys that have been your starters all year. Get out put your foot down, punch that lead out, then sit those guys down and let them rest. Yep, I agree. Um, from David Dillman, two days is a tough ask to prepare for Purdue after focusing on another matchup before that. I do agree. Um, the counter is FDU did it somehow last year, but I agree. Like I just, two days to tough to, to game plan for, you know, if not the best offense in the country, a top two, top three offense, pretty conservatively in the country. Like, with Zach Eady, the best player in the country, the most unique, the most dominant player in the country. Um, I, I said it kind of at the top. Like I, I'll take painter prepping two days on two days for anybody else rather than them having to prep for Purdue. Um, just with that. Yeah. And they're not from New Jersey, so we have that going. True. That is true. Do we know what state they're from? Alabama? Uh oh, geez. I thought they were from Georgia. No, Are they Louisiana. from Alabama? Louisiana. Louisiana. Oh God, we both missed. Yeah, we I knew it was we, that area. We were in the deep south. We yeah. had that going. <clears throat> um, you started this once. Facebook user said, "Any thoughts, comments on J James Madison versus Wisconsin?" I'm going to throw it to you because you started it. So here's my thing. Every every time that everybody is dead set that an upset's going to happen, I feel like it hardly ever actually happens. Um, when when every all the pundits are on it and. I just, man, you look at JMU, they beat Michigan State early. It looked like an awesome win. It turned out that Michigan State actually isn't very good and maybe shouldn't have even been in this tournament coming into it. Um, but I'm going to root for them because they're Big Ten and I'm a Big Ten homer when we get into the NCAA tournament. But I just, you you look at the rest of James Madison's schedule and it doesn't really jump out and impress you that much in terms of other people that they had to play from a strength of schedule, strength of record standpoint. And I just think they're a type of team to me when you, when you go up against a Wisconsin that is so super fundamental in what they do, and then you've got a super athletic guy that can create his own shot and store. And you have two big men and Crowell and wall, depending on the situation in a given game that can just eat down low unless Zach Eady's sitting underneath there. I don't buy it. Like, I don't buy it. Like, whatever the spread is, I'm going to hammer it. I think it's, it'll probably be around five, plus or minus one or two. Um, I'm taking whiskey off to cover the spread. And the, the case for James Madison is that Wisconsin is awful at defending the three-point line, and James Madison shoots a good amount and makes a lot. Um, and that is that is the main case. And then you have a dude like Terrence Edwards who can get downhill, kind of attack. He's going to get to that mid-range, that floater area, which Wisconsin is going to give up. Um, to me, it's, it's, yeah, it's simply, it's basically comes down to two things. It's it, what, what AJ store is Wisconsin getting? Are they getting big 10 tournament AJ store early season AJ store? Or are they getting February AJ store in terms of scoring the ball? Um, and then defensively, like I, I still don't trust Wisconsin's defense. It is better than James Madison's. Um, are they just going to let these guys get hot and get open looks because James Madison has one, two, three, four, five, six, probably six, six to seven guys. You have to legitimately respect from the three point line. 
they got to make him though. Um, I don't know exactly where I, I land on that. That's one I've been going back and forth on in my but head. But like, also in the last month, Chucky's woke up and been like, oh yeah, I used to be a really dominant offensive player at one point. And most of this year, he's just deferred to everybody else. And those last two to three weeks to me, it seems like he's really woken up. He, he's played incredible defensively this year. Yes. But all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, like I, I, I used to be the second most important offensive threat on this team until we added some new guys. And he's woke up and he's really started to play from that end as well again. And then I love Blackwell. Um, you know that. He's my favorite freshman in the Big Ten this year. I'm not going to say he had the best freshman season, but he's my favorite freshman uh, in the Big Ten. So I'm riding Wisconsin. Fair enough. Um, I do have one question for you because you said you're a Big Ten fan. Does that include Illinois then? You're rooting for Illinois to make it all the way to the uh, Final Four? I will root for Illinois. Yeah. Respect. I will. I will. Respect. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm with you. I'm, I'll be rooting for all the Big Ten teams. Um, none more yeah. so than Purdue, but. I mean, my, my thing with Illinois has always just been stylistically. I don't like the way they play. Like, I, I just, I don't enjoy that type of game. Um, but I'm going to root for Big Ten teams when we get to the NCAA tournament. If IU was, I'll catch heat for it. If IU was in, I would root for IU to go far in the big in the NCAA tournament for Big yep. Ten's sake. No, I would too. Um, and, and I will be rooting for Big Ten teams. That's what I do. Um It'll be interesting. There's a couple. Illinois has an interesting path, um, pretty tough path, to be honest. And then what can Michigan State do? And then can either Nebraska or Wisconsin beat Houston is kind of what it's going to come down to if they can make it that far. Um, also, Casey Tomonaga just needs to have his moments, whether it be in just this first weekend and they do get bounced, but like give him a 35 points, eight threes type like logo. Th like I, I, I need that also once. Um, so I think that's going to kind of wrap it up here. We did have a super chat from Heather Garrison. Um, do appreciate that as we are, are getting into um, we're, we're into it. Like the, the season is the, the postseason is here. I don't know where the season went. It's just kind of like, Oh yeah, March madness. It's time. It's go time. Uh, we're going to have obviously our post game show after um, the Purdue versus Grambling state game, which is at seven twenty five Eastern time. And hopefully we see a lot of you live both, at uh, the meetup spot before the game at two Eastern. And then also um, at the game in Indy. Uh, I, I hope it's, it's that Arizona type feel where it's, it's legitimately like a home game feel. Um, do you have anything else, Craig, anything at all? Uh, meet us at 2 PM at, at Hooters. Apparently. It is. And we will, <laughs> we will all have a good time. Joe will have his whiteboard. Um, he'll draw up plays for you while we were in there and specifically what you should order. There we go. So appreciate everybody tuning in um, on the way out. Just give this a, a quick like. And if you aren't subscribed, um, if you are watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. If you're watching somewhere else, we also do appreciate that. But if you could head over to our YouTube, um, it's under Brags in the Stands. If you look up Brags in the Stands, Boilers in the Stands, it's going to pop up. Just hit the subscribe button. It, it does help us a lot, especially as we're heading down this stretch um, and hoping and planning and expecting a, a pretty big uh, Purdue run. So hopefully we got a bunch of post game shows coming up for you. We do appreciate everybody tuning in and we will catch you Friday, both live at our meetup and after the game.